All right. How's it growing, friends? Welcome to Office Hours, your source for free cannabis cultivation education. My name is Keisha. I am one of your co-moderators today. How's it going, Mandy? Hey, Keisha. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad that we're back. We're here for episode 58. We really missed y'all. We're going live over on YouTube, so if you're logging on over there, make sure you send me your questions, and I'll get those over to the team. I'll go through our list of social media where you should be following us, so if you're on any of these platforms, please follow us, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Social Club. But you guys have sent in so many questions over the past few weeks, and we still have those, so I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to throw it back to you, Keisha. Fantastic, Mandy. Thank you so much. All right, we got Jason in the studio, and Seth is coming in remote. How are you guys? Doing great. Good. Doing pretty good. I'll, good. Uh, I just want to forewarn everyone. I'll be here for like a half hour. Then I got to board a plane, but uh, I'm going to leave my mic off and throw me the questions when you want me to say something, please. Amazing. Glad to have you on Seth and Jason. All right. We're going to just get into it. Ready for the first question, guys? Let's All go. right. I got a two-parter here from David. Submitted it a while back. Here's the first one. If I want to determine the field capacity of my medium using Arroyo, can I just super saturate the cocoa and wait two hours and then take a reading? Yeah, that's that's a good way to do it. Um, we actually have a video on our YouTube as well with um, with Ramsey back in the days that talks Ooh. about a great way to basically check using um, weight and your sensors to get an idea of what that field capacity is for a specific substrate. Um, so, you know, cocos, we see a lot of varieties in between say 45 and 65% of volumetric water content when they do hit that field capacity. So yeah, make sure that you, you know, are, are using the low flow to get up to super saturation then give it an yeah, hour, two hours or so. Um, probably the hour range would be good. And, uh, then take some measurements there. Um, check out that video we've got on, on YouTube. It's kind of a step-by-step -step explanation of a great way that you can check this with your specific media. Yeah, it's it's honestly, you nailed everything there, Jason. It's super easy. If you've got a good hydration tech already for your blocks, which should involve a decent soak, you know, not a 10 minute dunk or just a simple splash, just make sure you drain it off good enough and you're not sit having the block sit in a puddle when you do go take that test and it's it's pretty easy but it is very very important just like jason said you know we see a wide range in between brands and even in between batches and times of the year in cocoa so it's it's really good to establish that, that every time you start a new run just so you know where you're at and you're not accidentally over or underwatering your plants from a distance Fantastic. And for anybody who's on with us live here on the Hangouts, I just dropped the link to the video that Jason referenced in the chat. Um, and we'll also be sure to include that um, most likely in our blog post. But yeah, our knowledge base is full of great resources for you there as well. All right. Let me ask the second question from David. If I get runoff at, say, 48 percent, does this mean I'm at field capacity or does runoff now necessarily mean that field capacity has been reached throughout my medium? Because I get runoff around 48 percent. But if I saturate my medium, my meter reads 67 percent. After the runoff stops, I'm around 62 percent. So is 48 percent? Or 62% my field capacity. Did you get all those numbers, guys? I think so. Yeah. So I mean, kind of wrap around some of the points that we made is one, uh, let's make sure that this media either has been never soaked up before or hasn't um, been jeopardized by some low, uh, low volumetric water contents before. And the reason we're doing that is just to make sure that we're avoiding any hydrophobic properties, any dry and wet uh, pockets in that substrate in which the irrigation channeling could occur where we're getting runoff before we've gotten to our um, field capacity point. Um, yeah. Second part of that would also be, you know, making sure you are using a, a low flow emitters. That'll also help avoid any um, channeling those type of issues as well and make sure you are getting up to a field capacity. Um, yeah. Field capacity is usually going to be actually where that thing kind of likes to sit. Um, some of the time, if if usually if we're irrigating in a really good situation, we'll see runoff right about field capacity. Um, that being said, you know, if any of those caveats that we just talked about have happened, then that substrate's going to take a little bit longer for the capillary effect to actually um, soak all of the, the pore space in that media. 
Yeah, and I, I want to highlight, you know, we, we do spend a lot of time talking about how rock wool can develop hydrophobic pockets, and that's a big downfall. You can develop some of the same behaviors in cocoa if you don't do a proper job hydrating your media initially. So a lot of it really does go back to a proper hydration tech. Make sure you're where you're at and keep just keep testing it, you know. Make sure you know exactly what's going on with your BWC. And probably if you hydrate 1,000 or 1,500 blocks, go test at least 10 or 15 of them. Get a good idea what your variability is going to be because at the end of the day, especially with Coco, we are playing a game of averages and we can only control what we can inside the ranges that we have access to. So it's important to know that, you know, maybe this first one hit 65, go check another one that might hit 58, you know, see, see what we're looking at there. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point because, um, well, two, two things here is one, I know we're always talking about hydrophobic properties and rock wool and, and making sure we're avoiding it. Uh, I don't think we talk talk about it nearly as much as we actually encounter it with clients. Um, and so reiterating just the absolute necessity to start off with the best slate that you can when we're getting started with this um, growth cycle. Obviously, we also talk about, you know, things like, hey, every day later, it's harder to fix changes or mistakes. Um, you know, each day lost in production is, is one that we can't have back to have the optimal product. And so getting that idea of what your expected variation between blocks is helps you kind of verify that our sensor installation is good and that any maybe of the, the crop uniformity issues that we're trying to analyze aren't due to other variables um, that we're looking at with this data. So getting a good sample size is absolutely critical. Great, great point, Seth. Yeah, and you know, especially if you get some new media, don't be scared to explore it. Cut it open, dig it up, see what we're looking at here. I know different brands of cocoa over the years have experimented with different densities at different pot depths. Typically, they design that on purpose, so we hold more water in the area of the pot where the roots are going to uptake it. But it's good to know because I've encountered pots where that hydration tech was everything. If we didn't let them soak for at least an hour, you'd end up with cocoa blocks that have a still compressed bottom layer or top layer that you know, you're not going to get it to completely hydrate just to regular irrigation at that point. And then that's a percentage of your block that your plant can't utilize. And if that happens to be the bottom two inches, let's say, well, you, if that's still hard and compressed, you've got like less than half the pot volume to work with at that point. And just like Jason said, when the later we go, you know, if after transplant, that's not fixed immediately, your, your plant's going to suffer the rest of the run. Mikey's got a uh, uh, comment in on here. Thanks, Mikey. Uh, he says also always test a few of the cubes pots from each new batch ordered in. Inconsistency has been commonplace with most vendors. Um, you know, absolutely. If you're used to using one of the specific vendors for, you know, three years, two years, uh, five years, don't expect what you had dealt with and established as your standards back then to be true on today's order. So great point as well, Mikey. It's worth the time. I love this conversation. Yeah. It's really about setting your own benchmarks in the first place, right? Yeah. And, and while we're on that, you know, we should probably talk about EC on incoming cocoa blocks. Cocoa grows in a pretty salty environment typically. So depending on the time of the year that the coconuts were harvested, how long it's been sitting outside in a pile before processing, whether they were rained on, as a grower, you'll notice uh, at different points, even with the same brand, and that initial hydration, the first time you give it a uh, another shot, your runoff might come off pretty clear. Other times it might be pretty dark red, brown. So when you start seeing anything coming out, and even if you see clear water come out, it's always good to get an EC reading off of that runoff and establish, you know, if we've got 500 to 1,000 PPM in runoff of sodium, <laughs> like that's not good. You know, we don't want our plants growing in actual sea, sea salt type water. So uh, just check that, you know, always remember like anything in horticulture, you know, as, as much as we especially in cannabis, look at premium products that are pretty specifically designed. We're also paying a really low price point to uh, process and ship this stuff halfway across the globe. So we've got to, you know, temper our, our expectations and operate within that variability. Yeah, that that's a great point. It, it might be worth, um, you know, testing that cocoa with RO and or with your nutrients and seeing what that offset is. So if I'm coming in at RO at like 0.1 ECs, uh, you know, are we seeing that cocoa running off at 0.7 ECs and take, uh, take advantage of those measurements when you do your nutrient schedule. 
Yeah, and to back that up, I have seen blocks come in with, you know, over 1.0 EC in them in the runoff. It it happens. And at that point, you just go, okay, we've got a flush. You know, there were, I can think of a few brands that I won't name that used to have it printed on their blocks to say that said rinse them two to three times with nutrient solution. And that's that's why. You know, they weren't trying to be wasteful. They're just giving you a practical solution. And that would ensure that if you did that, you weren't going to run into a sodium issue with their media. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. It just goes to show you like the grower is always going to be super integral to this entire process. So um, I think we got some live questions over on YouTube. What's going on over there, Mandy? Oh yeah. You guys are commenting um, and asking questions. Broward County 74 wants to know, I'm curious if you have any recommendations for increasing terpenes and resin production through irrigation strategy rather than biomass. Yeah. So, um, you know, if, if terpene production is the utmost valuable, usually we'll go for more generative type of irrigation strategies throughout the plant life cycle. Um, those generative are the ones that typically uh, see a response from the plant that's uh, more potent in chemical composition. Yeah, you know, I mean, pushing that generative strategy is going to help focus on cannabinoid and terpene production, especially later in flower. If we've been able to, you know, where our traditional bulking period or not traditional, where our bulking period would be, if we continue to go more generative, bulk less there, you know, so less shots in a day, essentially. Um, we, we do see higher resin and terpene production. Another part of that equation uh, is environmental. You know, when we're looking at terpenes, it's a volatile compound. That's why we're part of why we're lowering our temps towards the end of flower. And that's currently, you know, kind of a big battle with people, like not with people, but that people are facing. Do I run a higher temperature and not deal with mold? And then kind of we're, you know, we're, we're all growing inside of a box now that we have licenses and buildings. So sometimes it's like, Hey, I want to get my yield up, but I don't have the dehue capacity to run a lower temper temperature. And when we look at temperatures under like 75 or so in late flower, and then, uh, having the dehue to deal with that, that helps with those not gassing those terps off essentially. And then a huge portion of that too, guys is post-production. You know, I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to and even experienced this myself several times where we went and hung up a crop and had an equipment failure in the dry room. And that, that loses it right there. You know, if your dry room AC goes out in the summer and that sucker spikes up to 85, 90 degrees, you say, say bye bye to your terps. You know, that's it's a bummer, but that that's just as important as growing good cannabis, uh, curating it and getting it to market in a, a desirable form. And I know the rule, don't beat up your buds. Um, that one, I do know. Uh, we do have another question that came in. This is a comment that came in over on YouTube. Um, let me know if you guys have any advice for, for this person. My pH runoff is a bit weird. Input pH is at 5.8. Output is at 4.5 EC. Input 2.8 EC. Outpoint, output four to five EC. I'm in Cocoa Media with Perlite. And I'm also going to put that in the chat right there. Yeah. I, first thing I would do is go get a leaf tissue analysis as quick as possible on this one. Um, probably getting some buildup of specific um, elements from your your nutrients. Uh, you know, if you're using a, a known branded nutrient that's out there right now, you know, probably two part salts if you're in a commercial scale. Uh, co get, a, get in contact with them, see what kind of recommendations they have for, for dealing with that. That's, uh, you know, one point three e or 1.3 ph lower than your input you know kind of my general rule of thumb is like 0 0.4 0 0.5 then i start to get worried if i'm 0 0.4 0 0.5 high or 0 0.4 0 0.4 low uh definitely something screwy is going on with how that plant is eating the nutrients in respect to the nutrient balance um in the feed so you know if you do have miscellaneous um supplemental that you're adding to a basic two-part nutrients, make sure you're talking to your manufacturer about, Hey, how could this affect what's going on? Also check out your, your mixing systems. Um, am I getting some fallout? Is there a precipitate in, in my tank or in my filters? Make sure you're cleaning out your filters as well. So, uh, kind of just getting, you know, getting down to one checking the basis. I would get a leaf, leaf tissue analysis out in anyways, uh, just because they're fairly inexpensive. It's going to take the lab a couple of days to process that and get you the results. Um, and hopefully 
that that'll help you from spending too many weeks trying to to deal with what this is going to do to your plants, which might end up in lockout. Yeah, I mean, check check out the whole situation. That's the reality, you know. Um, if it's a facility wide problem and it's all of your plants, yeah, really look at your irrigation system. Go get your EC readings at the actual dripper and make sure you don't have a mixing or fallout issue or something else. If it is just one finicky strain, yeah, immediately get that tissue analysis. And then what we'll look at is like, hey, on this particular nutrient line, the strain we might have to actually run at a lower EC with more runoff so that we're constantly correcting that pH balance every day. Um, and at that point, you know, evaluate, do we want to waste a bunch of water or require, you know, one monocrop room for this strain to treat it special? Uh, can we do that? Do we have a separate tank for that flower room where we can add what we need to or take out what we need to to keep this plant healthy? Yeah, and anytime we're troubleshooting anything, isolating variables like Seth is talking about is going to be the way to keep you from going crazy. Uh, it's so easy to kind of overlook some of the simple things that can make this happen uh, and, and dig into maybe something else that changed, even though we weren't maintaining something properly or, um, you know, some of the variation in, uh, in supplier materials, you know, maybe that cocoa or the uh, perlite coming in has had, uh, you know, bad wash on it or, or changed um, the actual suppliers to the brand name. And so, you know, take the first steps that you can to isolate the variables and that'll help you go down to the right path without wasting time. And, and I want to stress to you guys, it's, it's a lot easier to evaluate this if you have time series data going back as far as you can in that plant's life cycle. Because we could be talking about, you know, a strain specific deficiency, something wrong with that fertilizer. We could just be looking at, you know, low EC in the beginning, some severe drybacks that, you know, hampered its ability to maintain that pH balance. And then if you, you know, if we went zero runoff for let's say five days trying to build that EC, but we started at 1.5 and 1.8 EC in the block, we had some really hungry plants. Trying to get that to stack, it's just not doing it because the plant's uptaking so much. So we're not pushing runoff and replacing that pH balance. So sometimes uh, what looks like horrible plant disease deficiency can actually just be a simple irrigation problem earlier on. And then, you know, the cumulative effect of uh, small mistakes building up over a few weeks. Thank you guys for that. Oh my gosh, that was a wealth of information. Um, yeah, keep those questions coming over there on YouTube. And then Bilbo had a, a comment, monocropping for the win. Yeah, um, that's it for over on YouTube for now. So I'm going to pass it back to you, Keisha. Thank you, Mandy. Yeah, on the subject of kind of checking in on, on what's happening on a, on a separate basis, somebody wrote in a question around leaf uh, surface temperature. They were wondering what's the best time to measure this. And they were wondering if y'all have any recommendations on like a, a good laser ther thermometer. They wrote in, I've gone through over six or seven laser thermometers and have even tried an infrared camera. There always seems to be di big discrepancies between all of them. And I have no idea which one to rely on. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, a challenge that we all face. You know, I get, I always get calls from people comparing our equipment to other equipment. It's like, all right, give me the name brand, the model. I'm going to look up the, um, that accuracy of that sensor. And if it's plus or minus 5%, then I have to add, you know, the plus or minus, um, you know, 1% of our sensor on top of that. So we could be, Hey, and maybe I'm 6% off in humidity and these sensors are actually agreeing, which is very brutal way to start making SOPs and expecting people that don't understand this stuff to operate. Um, but, but yeah, back to the point, um, as far as the time to take leaf surface temperature, we're, we're seeing, I mean, I've seen some studies that suggest that there's slightly different amounts of, um, transpiration throughout the day um talking about a little bit of uh, a little bit less transpiration in towards the evening so uh as a basis probably not within the first hour or the last hour of lights on um i would probably just take a few of them they're fairly quick go across the room take samples uh you know in different places on that plant uh, make sure that you are getting some of the top exposed leaves as well to see that the highest leaf surface temperatures, the ones that are getting the most radiation to them. Um, and, you know, build, build a quick T curve. You know, if it takes 30 seconds to take and record a sample, go take 10 of them or 20 of them across the room and, and start to understand, all right, well, when I'm over by the uh, HVAC system or the, when I'm closer to the mister, I've got a little bit higher transpiration. All right, all right let's, 
let's see the spatial um, variance across that so we can actually have a good standard of comparison. As far as um, which laser thermometer to use, if you can get one that has a NIST um, rating, that's going to be a good start. Uh, typically, these are going to be substantially more expensive than uh, a lot of the ones that we're used to using for industrial uh, applications. But uh, you know, leaf surface temperature could be a fairly um, finicky measurement. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's a one to ten thousand kind of reading, so it's a good idea to just get a feel for the light layout of your room and what kind of stratification of that radiation you have at different depths. Because like, just like Jason said, you know, those top leaves that are most exposed, those start going above about 85 degrees and we get some pretty undesirable effects. Um, and another thing too to look at, you know, the easiest ways to, to do this is going to be, you know, right after your P1. It's a great time to go check everything in the room and get some readings. Uh, personally, especially if I'm dealing with uh, a light setup that I haven't quantified very much, I like to get it in the morning during that first hour after P1. And then in the afternoon too, and start to ramp, like uh, look at what my ramp is like in leaf surface temperature. So if early in the morning I go and see that like, wow, I kicked the lights on full blast and these are, you know, 90 degrees leaf surface temp, and then they cool down four degrees after we get some transpiration. I might ramp my lights up a little bit to try to match that curve and not, you know, keep that plant in optimum model conductance. Yeah. And I mean, so talking about things that are affecting our leaf surface temperature, um, obviously the room temperature is going to be one of the most influential aspects of leaf surface temperature, uh, mix the amount of radiation that's hitting that leaf surface. Um, then we talk about the stomatal conductance. So how much, uh, water vapor is leaving these plant, uh, stomates that's going to be cooling the plant down as well. And then in relationship to that, that P1 thing, uh, actually substrate um, temperature. So the temperature of the irrigation coming in can, can change that um, plant leaf surface temperature as well. So quite a few variables playing here. Great overview, guys. Thank you so much for that. All right, uh, we got some action helping over on YouTube. I'm gonna send it to Mandy. Yeah, we submitted a poll to y'all. And um, the question was, what's more important to your success as a grower? So the answers were data, science, and both. And so data came in at 10%, science came in at 10%, and then both came in at 80%. So pretty important, both of them, I would say. And then, yeah, we also have some more questions rolling in. This one's from Anthony. He says, Hey, I was reading a little on your runoff post on Instagram. I would love to get some info, if possible, on what I should be expecting putting in 6.0 pH and 3.0 EC and how much water content I should be looking, for, looking to finish the day off with the last feeding. And they're in one gallon pot cocoa. I'll add that in the chat. Cool. Yeah. Good to hear that they're on cocoa, you know, at a 6.0 pH, that's definitely a, a good range for cocoa. I like to be at, you know, five, eight, typically, um, sometimes six Oh for cocoa. Um, let's see how much water content should I be looking to finish the day off with the last feeding? Going to have to answer that with what the field capacity of that specific cocoa that you are using. So as we mentioned earlier, most of the cocos we work with, we see between 45 and 65% for field capacity. Some of them are a little bit higher um, every once in a while. So if we are early in the plant cycle, we're trying to do generative steering, something like a, a one gallon cocoa, you might see about 25% uh, loss in water content. And, uh, this is pretty important because if we are to say a 65%, uh, field capacity type of cocoa, it means we're going to be hitting, you know, 40% water content. Um, now if our cocoa is going to be only getting field capacity, at say 45%, that's going to put us at 20% water content. And so we may not want to push generative quite that hard with that specific type of media. In that case, you know, we need to either get a cocoa that'll hold a little bit more water content or possibly move to a, a, a two gallon. Um, some of these numbers that I'm giving out are based on very rapidly growing plants, uh, you know, say maybe week uh, two, you know, week one and a half, week two to, uh, for generative steering in uh, in that flower life. Um, so obviously if we're looking for a vegetative irrigation, we'll want to be at a closer dryback to probably around 15%. And um, 
that, you know, it's a little bit safer range if you are in a, in a one gallon cocoa that has a lower field capacity. And uh, sometimes we just have to run things a little bit more balanced if we don't have just the right situation to uh, accelerate the growth of our plants as, as best as possible. Yeah, I think awesome. I think you touched on something important, Jason, there, which is uh, that dryback number is going to vary widely depending on plant size. I mean, even if we looked at two plants that were within 10 grams of each other, one plant might literally have leaves that have more stomata on it and transpire water faster. So when we're talking about those percentages, we want to keep in mind that like if everything is ideal, we're looking for that 15 to 25 percent. Um, plenty of options exist outside of that. So, you know, really it goes back to your field, like you said, field capacity, figuring out how big your plant is and then watch it and use, you know, we can run some pretty big drybacks in cocoa, for instance, but data is key. You know, if I can push it from 65 to 20, cool. But I'm going to moderate that and say, okay, what's my EC doing? My EC spikes from six to 24 when I do that. I might bring it back up at like 35%, not 20%. So, you know, Dryback number is important if you're not seeing a decent one, but if you are seeing over 10%, really focus on your EC and then just watch your plants to make sure they look healthy. And you're, I, one thing we can't iterate this enough, if you're experiencing that low dryback and it's not a VPD or light related issue, um, you're probably gonna have to correct it with pot size on the next run or incoming plant consistency. Those were all really good tips. Thank y'all for that. Um, I'm going to keep going down our list. This one's about lighting. Bob Farms wants to know, I'm really trying to dial in my DLI and trying to push my PFD going from veg to flower. Should there be such a drastic drop in the DLI or should I try to compensate the drop of DLI by raising the light intensity? to match my numbers from veg to flower. So if my DLI and veg maxes out at 35 and I do nothing to my light intensity, my DLI and flower will go from 35 to 26. Please advise. Thank you. The answer is yes. Do not drop your DLI through almost any part of the flower cycle if you can avoid it. Um, so obviously daily lighting integrals, the number of photons that are hitting the leaf surfaces uh, for a specific area in the entire course of the photo period. So if we are at 18 hours for our lights on duration, we'll need to up our intensity 33% when we go to a 12 hour photo period. Uh, we wanna make sure we're getting the same amount of energy to these plants. If we look at the very basic of plant growth, we're looking at the chemical equation for photosynthesis. We've got CO2 plus water catalyzed by light, and that's giving the uh, sugars, uh, basically the food for that plant to grow. And if we decrease our light by 33%, that's six hours, um, that being you know the same intensity of light, so a lower DLI when we go into flower, you're going to lose a third of the amount of photosynthetic capabilities of that plant. That's definitely going to delay how quickly that you can build your flowers. And if you are in a competitive time frame, for producing bud, then you, you, you're, you're going to lose out on growth time. Absolutely. And I think one thing to really bring up here, Jason, is that, you know, when we're talking about matching DLI coming from veg into flower. We're not talking about going from, you know, 450 PPFD all the way up to say 1200, right? We're talking about usually more like a 200 PPFD increase. So matching DLI, if your plants are showing signs of stress, you know, look at all your other variables, but I know we've seen it proven out many, many times and grows all over that matching DLI works fine with healthy plants. You're not going to torch them with that increased intensity. However, if you awesome. only get 300 PPFD in veg, you're not going to be able to do it. Or you're, you're, it's going to be slower. Just like Jason said, you won't have the total amount of photons and not as much photosynthesis. Y'all, it's been so long since we've asked a great lighting question like that. Thank you for that. Keep sending, keep sending those over. Um, but until then, I am going to pass it back to Keisha for our online questions that we got in through Instagram. Thank you, Mandy. Yeah, I love it. This is such a good, it's so good to be back on Office Hours. We love these conversations. Um, since we were talking about uh, runoff and EC earlier, I'm going to bring up this question from Golf Ma. Wrote in. I'm seeing my substrate EC is lower than my runoff EC in week two of flower. That isn't normal, is it? No, 
that's not that normal. Um, in most cases, we'll it is if your substrate EC is lower than your feed EC. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you're going, uh, my first question would be, are you using liquid nutrients and do you have a sensor in there? Because that's highly likely that's what's happening. There it is. Golfma, let us know what happens. Keep us posted. Um, I want to speak to a comment. Bilbo, you want to you wanna unmute yourself and speak to your comment you dropped here in the chat? Sure. It's coming from having done it both ways, but having a place where you can log all the different decisions over multiple harvest groups really helps compare apples to apples. I have been victim of, you know, sporadic information going into different systems and never really being able to compare information when I'm trying to correct uh, in future harvest groups. And I felt like it was appropriate to just put it in the comments that, you know, your information really is your key metric that you can use to, well, maybe it's not a key metric, but it's certainly a, a major point that you can use to affect your decisions in the future and learn from what you've done in the past. And I think that the platform as it continues to expand offers a lot of these places where that information can be input and really create a log, uh, whether it's of an individual cultivar or an entire room if it's monocrop. Yeah, I mean, totally like love that comment, Bill, but at the end of the day, it's really about like growers setting the parameters for what it is that they're trying to achieve. And, and you know best based on your own knowledge um, and uh, being able to like log your data just gives you the support um, to be able to do that. Really the the recipe, ideally, uh, when you look back at all at, at uh, historical data, right? Yeah, but as a, as a grower, you're constantly solving, you know, 50 different problems from uh, mechanical ones or, or, or cultivar environmental ones or IPM. I mean, there's, there's a litany of, of problems that you face. So good record keeping. Um, I, I found in, in the past is usually the difference between, you know, a minor success and a major success or a complete write-off. Absolutely, Bilbo. I mean, I think you brought up something really, really important and that's that we're all human. <laughs> And uh, we invented things like writing to help us keep track of information. And if you've got even four rooms in flower, man, you've cranked out a lot of crops in two years. And most likely you've got several runs with the same strains. So you want to be really good at organizing that data. That way, if you do run into a problem, you can actually identify it. I know I've got said it here before and I'll say it again. I've got all kinds of pictures on my phones with a date stamp. And man, I got to dig through some files to actually get any other details to try to identify what's going on. And at that point, that information is less useful and also more expensive because it's taking more of my time to find it. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I have been hearing the term data quite, a, quite a bit here in this episode. And, um, really it's, it's about information as well. So data is typically more easy to make comparisons, analytics, and, um, have decisions based on large portions of it. For me, I started cultivating and I was just capturing information. Um, this was all types of things like photos, time lapse videos, and you know, starting to think about, you know, how how did this information um get captured, get stored, and how to become useful. And I think that's one one of the reasons that data is the first step is because it's much, much easier to turn into a good decision. Um, that being said, I think the best growers out there are taking pictures every day of their plants, of their cultivars, um, and, and making sure that, you know, how the biology of that's performing is, is tracked visually as well. You can take a quick shirt picker and you can quicker than you can write a note. Uh -huh. I always tell people that it's, it's so easy. And we have the technology now that used to cost money and take some time. Now it's super easy to get all that information rounded up and put it in a, an accessible spot. Yep, we have AV equipment in our pockets now, right? 
Uh, Bilba wrote the comment here, qualitative and quantitative about the data. That's right. Okay, we're going to keep going with these questions here. Um, let's see here. Um, Tyler wrote in, I'm currently using Floorflex bubblers with one quarter tubing and nothing at the end. Open flow. With this setup, I can't accurately measure my uh, milliliter per shot sizes. What would you recommend to add to the end of the one quarter tubing in order to have consistency with my shot sizes? Uh, yeah, so somewhere in there you need a some type of regulator. So a, a pressure compensating emitter would be one of the most common options to to do that. You know, we always talk about low flow. Um, that's really going to help one the consistent or the uniformity across the rooms and give you a more predictable amount of water coming out of that system. Yeah, so completely uncorked like that, you're probably looking at, I mean, depends on what octobubbler system you have. They're probably 20 gallons per hour. Floriflex does offer inserts to neck that down to two gallons per hour. But personally, um, I would advocate just what Jason's saying, making the move to pressure compensating emitters and making your life easier. Um, or big beds. <laughs> I don't know, big pots, big plants, and have the need for 20 gallons an hour or even two. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Dropping, dropping some nuggets and some tips over here. All right, Mandy, I'm going to send it over to you. Yeah, lots of questions about irrigation this episode. Oh my goodness. wonder what that's about. Uh, we had another question come in. Key Capone wants to know, how do I get more root growth during the first few weeks of flower? Uh, yeah. So a couple things that are going to affect how much root growth you have is, uh, are we transplanting at the time of, of flipping to 12, 12 cycle? Um, have we already rid in in veg? And so this is kind of where you kind of go, you need to think about the best rooting in principles. And uh, so many times I've seen people running, um, you know, like a, a rock wool four by four on a two gallon cocoa or any type of mixed media that is going to make it even more challenging to do that simply because of the, the different um, hydro, hydraulic conductivities and, and other properties between those two substrates. Uh, so, you know, think about hey, how much complexity are we adding to the situation when we're trying to root in uh, and then really uh, break it down into what does your rooting in irrigation practices look like. So, you know, making sure that we've got our lights in check, our VPD is where we need it to be, um, all of those things going on. Um, then you can start to deep dive and say, all right, I want to make some small pulse irrigations just to keep that plant alive, but I'm not going to give it too much water because I don't want root stagnation. Uh, if we always keep that, well, that water content high, those, those roots aren't going to reach out and try and seek out the rest of the media. So typically we'll, we'll look at, um, doing small irrigations, um, anywhere between say one and four or more a day, uh, during that root end phase. And, and then maybe even let a little bit of, uh, dry back for just a couple of days to make sure that those roots are getting seeked out. But it's a fine balance because obviously when we're transplanting, we don't have the nearly the root mass. Um, so we do have to make sure that we're keeping that plant alive with some water, but not too much and making sure that it's working to seek the entire volume of the substrate. Awesome. Yeah, Great think, tips. You oh. know, going into that, guys, a very important thing is a veg. You know, if you come out of veg with weak roots, you're not going to have a good time transplanting. If you're in veg too long, the same problems that can happen putting a block on a slab can happen with a clone going into a one or two gallon. So I wish I wish Jason or I, I wish I had a whiteboard here. I know Jason doesn't have one behind him, but basically what we want to see in that root in period is that water content actually fall, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 percent over like, let's say, a five to seven day period but we're not excluding water from it we're giving it small pulses to help move oxygen into the root zone and stimulate root growth down into the block but one thing to remember is if that block is at 70 percent we've got to get some pore space in there for those roots to have oxygen and also seek out growth so um like i said i wish we had the line but you want to make sure you get an appropriate dry back but not too much same thing goes if you uh, don't keep up with it enough and you dry back way too far too early you're also going to hinder that root growth so it's uh, it's all about babying them really giving them what they need i love that it's all about babying them we always look out for the roots around here uh we also posed another poll over on youtube we wanted to know how are you watering your garden and our answers were hand watering and automatic drippers and no one answered for hand watering and everyone's on automatic 
automated drippers. So thank you all for that. Um, I think that's it for the questions over on YouTube for now. So I will pass it over to you, Keisha. So we expected those results because the people that are hand watering uh, aren't able to have the time to fill out your survey. They don't have time to log into office hours, right? They're too busy. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, hey, a few of them have over the years. They're, they'll get there. They'll get there. They like to be busy. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Trying to make lives easier. Um, all right. We're rounding out the hour here. Just to note to anybody who's on with us live, if you have questions for Seth and Jason, now's the time. Um, so make sure you drop those questions over on YouTube here on the chat so we can get those addressed for you. All right. We got a question in here specifically about Arroyo. John wanted to know, how would I reflect mortality rates of groups of plants? And I think they're speaking to in the system, in the Arroyo platform. Um. Yeah. So obviously in the harvest group, you can reflect how many plants are in there. And, um, if you are metric integrated, basically when you go from your clone lot to your tagged flower lot, um, you, you can account for the plants that were in the clone lot that don't get tagged. Um, and that's usually going to end up as your mortality rate. Yep, much easier to track with tags, but we, we are, we are working on that part too. More and more analytics are always coming out. We're we're constantly refining the system to, cap to capture more and more data. That's right. So stay tuned. All right. I got another question here. Humboldt, uh, oh, sorry. Charles left a comment on YouTube a while back and wanted to know what weeks are best to defoliate. Any, any tips on that? It's going to be a little bit cultivar dependent. Um, most of uh, the successful regiments that I run into are usually around, you know, week three um, and, and typically then, you know, later in flower, uh, say a week, 10 days before uh, harvesting just to help the team keep stuff cleaned up. Yeah, I mean, some of it's going to depend on your strategy and your sales strategy. Are you selling only jarred nug? That's top grade. If so, we're going to go very hard, very early. Um, do you have a lot of market for extracts, B grade joints and things like that? Um, if you do have that market for extracts, we're going to go more with what Jason was saying, you know, right around the end of week three, beginning of week four, but it's going to be strain dependent. So instead of weeks, I'll just say the end of stretch. That way you can get out your tape measure and really figure it out. And then, you know, at the end of that, ideally for in our first default, we want to remove any buds and branches that we don't think are going to be desirable. That way we're not wasting more time growing them and doing more damage to the plant later. And then, you know, after a certain point, usually that's, you know, week three to four cleanup, we're not going to pull any leaves off of buds anymore. We're only going to take fan leaves that are connected at elbows and crotches. That way uh, we're not, I mean, anytime you pop a leaf off the plant, there is an oxen response. So... The more deleafing you do, the more you're interrupting that growth growth cycle and telling the plant to take energy away from bud development and put it into callus development to cover up all those nice scars you made. So it's fairly conservative, but it is key to go uh, go hard at the times that you need to to not get an overbushy plant. And then also, you know, each runs a learning experience, right? If we've got a strain that we treated one one way that's different this time, take those pictures log it some i mean i've seen such a diversity out there of being having some strains that will fill out a table and still have rock solid golf balls like a foot and a half deep in the canopy they're just more efficient at transporting energy around the plant whereas others that that lollipop type uh, pruning is very very important and, and one thing I, I like to stress with people the defoliation techniques you know grab your leaf and cut that petiole with scissors or your thumbnail leave just a bit of that petiole twig on there because the plant actually does have an adaptation to die back right there. There's an, what's called an abscission zone at that node. Um, when you pop the leaf off, we actually disturb that abscission zone. And again, cause that oxen hormonal response where we get a little bit of callus, late flower that can cause some minor herming and re-veg type symptoms. So the safest thing to do is, again, just cut that petiole, leave an inch, half inch twig, and the plant will dry that back on its own and seal up that, that abscission zone. So you're not, you're not causing a hormonal response when you do it. That's, that's the big thing, you know. As the plant goes from uh, its stretch period where it's got a high oxen state, it's pushing roots, pushing uh, long structural growth. We want that to flip over to be, you know, more of a cytokine, and there's a few others we can go into, but 
we're changing that oxen ratio, oxen to cytokinin. So inducing the plant to produce more oxen later in flower is going to give us more veg and non-finishing characteristics. Horticulture at work. This is serious business over here. I also really appreciate um, the discussion around planning, depending on what your product is. Pre-roll needs are going to be different from concentrate needs, which are going to be different from flower needs. So, yeah, growers, you got a lot on your plates. Amazing. Um, Mandy, what's going on on YouTube? Oh, my gosh. What a great discussion, everyone. We had another question come in from Dr. J. Is there a training on your home sensors? I really want one, but I'm not sure how to read the graphs. Uh, are we talking about the Solus? I don't, I don't think our Solus offers graphing yet. So uh, best way that you can do that is to obviously graph it on your own from that Solus device. Uh, as far as reading the graphs, um, check out some of the resources that are uh, are available from maybe Rockwell supplier or your nutrient supplier. Um, right now, if we're seeing both of those companies jumping in and, and giving great explanations, uh, look at some more office hours. Uh, you know, we go through and talk about how this time series data gives you some indicators on uh, what your what your plants are feeling as far as a, a physiological response to how you're you're dealing with them, mostly in response to environment and irrigation factors. Um, and, and really that's going to dictate is how is this plant going to turn out morphologically? You know, what are we going to get from what we're doing to it? Yeah. And I, I think, awesome. correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but I, sorry, I have to hit on mute, Mandy. Um, I believe we, uh, meter group does have a white paper on volumetric water content. I think that's one of the hardest things for people to grasp when they first start using our sensors is, you know, traditionally we talked about saturation, not VWC. So step one, understand that and what it means. You know, if you're thinking saturation and Jason and I are talking VWC, we're, you know, that's oranges and apples. They're not comparable and you're going to have some bad results if you do the same kind of uh, number application to those. Um, the other thing, you know, Jason said, start building a spreadsheet and make your graphs and just have some good SOPs on when to collect it. You know, if you can get a reading before you irrigate, after you irrigate to make sure you've reached field capacity and look at your EC. And then at the end of the day, that's going to be a good basic tech to start using those and then building some graphs in a spreadsheet. Um, if you start using the spreadsheet very religiously, you may not need the graphs until the, you hit the end of the run and you want to actually look back. Awesome. Thank oh, you, and Keisha. Keisha, Keisha found it. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Yeah. So we do have that on our site. Um, but yeah, it's it's really all about understanding volumetric water content, you guys. Thank you all for your questions. We're going to keep going down our list when we have a few more minutes. Deer in the Garden wants to know, what EC range do you recommend for ripening? Uh, so things usually get a, a little bit wild during ripening. Um, and when we talk about EC range, obviously there's a couple ways to talk about this and we'll take it right from what I talked about is uniformity, a snapshot right now of, of what things are and then consistency. Um, when we talk about a range, this is why time series data is so important. If I've got pretty large drybacks during ripening and I might even be feeding it say half or three quarters nutrients level or have modified my nutrient schedule to reduce the amount of nitrogen, you know, we could be feeding it say two five or, or 3.0. Um, we might see those ECs go way up. If we're feeding it something like 2.0, we might be seeing our, our uh, reset ECs down at say two, uh, maybe we're pushing a little bit more runoff. Maybe they're, uh, you know, just sitting there right there at, at uh, you know, one, nine, two, three. Uh, and then since we're doing huge drybacks, all right, you see might be up at 12, 15, might be higher than that. Um, and so as far as the range goes, it's uh, kind of trying to define is that mean where I'm at nominally for my uh, daytime low EC? Is that my... Uh, uh, my spike right before I irrigate the next day. Um, you know, is the range that the amount between those two, or is the range, uh, you know, where I want to be for one of those points in time every day. Uh, and so it's kind of a 
a hard question to talk about. I do wish I had my whiteboard right here because uh, <laughs> I could circle those things and, and talk about it. Maybe I'll get a pin for my my tablet here and we'll work off that. In the future. Yeah, we need to get a whiteboard in there one of these days. Yeah, this one's a lot easier to visualize than it is explained for sure. Um, you know, I just want to add it. It really has a lot to uh, EC values in ripening have a lot to do with what the EC was at during growth. You know, so if we didn't achieve a high EC earlier on in generative, we're not going to be looking for a super high EC. That's probably going to stress the, stress the plant. If uh, we've managed to hit a pretty high EC, let's say like a seven to a 12 during generative, and then we backed it off just slightly to more like a six to a nine or 10 during bulking. And then now we've removed those P2s. Just by that nature, we're going to get a deeper dry back and a higher EC swing. But what you want to look out for is sudden spikes that go well out of the ranges you've been exposing your plant to. That's when we start to see, you know, and it works both ways. If it spikes to 22, 25, that can be detrimental if we've been hitting a max of 12 the whole time. If it goes down to uh, 0.3 instead of uh, down to 5 when you water, like let's say you flush it out, we've got the same problem, that osmotic imbalance. And at this point in the plant's life, we're trying to push it into senescence. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't change its root structure anymore. It, it's incapable of adapting very quickly to those changes. So that's something to look out for. You know, if you flush it out or you spike it up, that's really putting the plant out of optimal production and also potentially pushing certain things that we've all seen, like herms, uh, some other issues that we don't want to hit. And, and, you know, that's especially true with some of today's, you know, rapidly being pushed through different types of crosses. You don't necessarily know when you get cuts if they came from, like, let's say, a feminized cross where a lot of times that high EC in the end will get you. So really, it's all about crop registration and paying attention to it. Yeah. And that's a really good point that you're talking about the, the plant life cycle, because basically what's happening is the plant's starting to learn an EC tolerance, right? And for anyone that wants to dive into the biology of, uh, of osmotic potential or differential, um, go look up. If we get way too high or low in EC, it's going to, these cells, the tugger pressure is going to be affected by a hypo, a hypotonic or a hypertonic um, situation. And, uh, you know, if we're achieving the right amount of nutrients, we're going to be pushing on both sides of isotonic as far as uh, that osmos osmosis goes. I, I think you really nailed that one, Jason. You, you're teaching your plant to live in this EC range. That's the easiest way to think about this without trying to stress yourself too much about salt and sugar ratios. Thanks for making it easier. <laughs> Thank you guys for that. And thank you for making it easier for us to understand that too. Um, I think we have time for another question. Uh, this one's also about EC. The inside dope wants to know, I'd like a better understanding of why such a range of ECs are effective in growing cannabis and also a better understanding into the plant responses to vegetative and generative cues. Any recommended reads? Uh, to answer the first question, it's because cannabis is a weed. That's why it's very tolerant. Um, it's one of the fastest growing plants that we know of. And so, uh, you know, as we've encountered the different levels that these plants um, can can work off of, uh, historically, you know, people used to be definitely on the lower side of ECs. And a lot of it had to do with how we were balancing the nutrients for them um, and making sure that the rest of the variables were optimized. Um, now that we've made a lot of headway as far as the right environments and, and right nutrient compositions for these plants, the right light levels, CO2 supplementation, they can usually take a little bit higher EC than what we've seen in the past. Um, so that that's why... Uh, They've got a pretty big EC range. It's very strain dependent as well. Uh, we'll see some strains perform uh, substantially better at higher ECs and some of them that, that start to do uh, a little bit worse if we go too high with those. Yeah, one thing I want to point out too, when you start looking at information in plant science, it's not that cannabis is insanely different than a lot of other plants. Um, a big part of it is uh, agronomy has been a huge factor in plant research over the last hundred years. So most of our plant research outside of, you know, botany and really researching very interesting plants that we don't actually commercially cultivate um, has been approached with the idea that we're going as low input as possible to achieve an acceptable yield. 
Well, when things are at a low commodity price, that's how we approach it. Fortunately for cannabis growers, the commodity price is high enough that we can look at using more inputs than traditional agriculture did. And that's where we get into kind of, you know, if I came out of uh, growing blueberries, for instance, I am really, I mean, every cent I put into the water counts. You know, that's all money out of my pocket. Whereas in cannabis, I can, you know, recoup some of those costs by having a higher quality product. So that's one thing to really consider when you're looking back at this. The same principles apply, uh, but some of the values, just like when you're, if you built a greenhouse or grow room about five years ago, i am always go back to it, small deltas. <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't counting on that much biomass in a room. None of the other principles mathematically are, the equations themselves still work. We just weren't plugging big enough values into them for humidity potential, <laughs> if that makes sense. So, you know, read it read any information you can get on plant science especially basic plant physiology because that's where a lot of it does hold true with cannabis especially if we're talking about osmotic stress uh i'm going to avoid using drought stress uh, how the plant responds to infusion of oxygen into the root zone and what's kind of going on there you know understanding how plants work naturally is going to get you miles ahead in understanding how you're manipulating them and why they're responding the way they are yeah. And you know, it's probably one of my favorite resources is university extensions as well. Um, meet up with the people that have been doing uh, horticulture techniques for, you know, the last 30, 40 years, and they'll point you in a direction of, of the, probably the level of um, information that you need. Uh, and, uh, you know, for me, I'm a fairly impatient learner. So I, sometimes I'll find myself uh, on Wikipedia and I'll have like, you know, 10 or 12 tabs opened up by the time I'm done reading one article. Cause it's like, oh, I don't know what that, uh, that hormone is. Let's figure out how it affects the plant's balance. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of basic online free plants about classes about plant science that you can take and, you know, not have to pay, like I said, not have to pay a bunch do it at your own pace and just, you know, Keep an open mind. What you're reading about tomatoes is still going to teach you about growing cannabis. It's still horticulture. You know, we're just going to, again, adjust those values and the strategies a bit. Learning the science is key. Learning the science is key. Oh, that was a good question. The Inside Dope said, love the education. Well, we love that question. Um, yeah, I think that's all the time we have for that over on YouTube. So I will pass it back to you, Keisha. Thank you, Mandy. Yep, this is all about agriculture and cannabis is, is out of the shadows now. So it's really just kind of learning from other agricultural products. That's what we're doing. Amazing. All right. Um, I got a write in from Sean This is on, on a theme for today. I can't get my water percentage up over 30. I'm using two gallon cocoa with 0.3 drippers. I run it for 25 minutes. I get run up, but percentage isn't going above 30. Am I doing something wrong? Uh, you know, first thing I would do is try to break up that irrigation to smaller chunks. Um, usually I try not to irrigate for much more than uh, five minutes in duration. If my systems are capable of, of doing so. And that's just going to help that, that substrate have a little bit more capillary effect. Um, those low flow emitters that you you have are definitely helping. Um, and then also, you know, follow that link that we put in the channel earlier about uh, validating the field capacity of that specific media. Um, that is definitely lower than we usually see in cocoa, but you know, we, we don't know specifically what, uh, what model of, uh, or what brand of cocoa you've got working. Yeah. Try to break that up into four or five irrigations that are much shorter and then hop on next week and ask us again. <laughs> I think you'll have a lot better success getting that field cap up. All right. So Sean, if you're out there, let us know how it goes. Okay. Do what our experts recommend. All right. I'm going to keep it going here. we got a few more minutes. See if any questions we have left here. Um, I'm not going to pronounce this right, but Gane Bosem wrote in, they want to know what our SOPs are for runoff nutrient disposal. What would you guys recommend? Uh, depends what you can do with it. Uh, you Don't know, dump it in the storm drain. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun that, uh, I, you know, I, I think a lot of us are, um, sad to see what happens with uh, the nutrients in an ideal world. Uh, we, you know, we're hitting it with a UV treatment or, um, uh, you know, a reverse osmosis treatment where we are, um, cleaning out that, that water and reusing it with some amount of 
pre-levelized nutrients. Uh, you know, in application, this has become actually pretty challenging for most of the people in this industry, simply because we begin to see nutrient imbalances and, um, you know, recirculation is, uh, is something where we have a lot more variables going in than we do when we're just, uh, feeding, uh, clean water and adding the nutrients that we know are going in. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it depends on your scale, you know. Uh, bioremediation is an awesome strategy, but if you're in an urban environment, that's kind of difficult. This is one of those aspects where the industry is really progressing quickly. So I think in a few years, we'd have a lot better uh, answers right now. Responsible wastewater disposal, follow your local laws, don't let water with an excessive amount of PPM go off of your property. You know, make sure everything's within spec for your state, county, and city that you live in. <laughs> So wastewater plant or bioremediation pond is usually the two options. One thing that will be coming, though, hopefully in the next few years, is being able to convert that into biodiesel by growing algae. Um, we're just, again, we're, the industry is developing. and We haven't had this demand for IEC runoff yet. Yeah, looking forward to more sustainable options as the as the uh, industry continues to mature. Okay, I'm going to ask this last one that Kevin Perez wrote in, guys. Would there be a change in quality, in your opinion, if your drying takes about 30 days instead of 14 through 16 for the SEMS to snap? My understanding is that if the environment stays 60-60, they'll be okay. What are your thoughts? Uh, you know, usually... Most producers that I work with just don't have the the time frame in a production schedule in order to let things dry that long. Um, it's probably, you're not going to see a huge difference as long as you're still hitting your target water activities uh, in those plants at, at being at a, say, 16-day versus 30-day. And that, that's obviously a, a massive change in the schedule. It's going to depend on what you're doing with your cure process as well. Um, you know, are we, are we maintaining controlled environments downstream from this as well? And, and how long are we, we're planning to, to cure it? So dry process. Yeah. Uh, probably, probably not a huge deal as long as the other variables are, are similar. Yeah. If it's sealed up, uh, right over here. Okay. If it's sealed up, you should be okay, but it's a lot harder to seal a, a 200, 400 square foot room than it is a, a tote or a bucket. So that 30 day would probably be more like a 30 day or about a 10, 14 day dry and you know, 14, 15 day cure just on the stem. All right. There it is. Big finish. Thank you, Seth and Jason, for joining us, for, an, for hosting another great session. Mandy, as always, thank you for being my co-moderator. And producer Chris, we appreciate you. Thank you for everything you're doing over there behind the scenes. All right. Thanks to everybody who joined us for Office Hours today. We do this every Thursday. The best way to get answers from the expert is to join us live. To learn more about Arroya, um, feel free to book a demo with us, and one of our experts will tell you walk you through all the different ways where it can be used to improve your cultivation production process. But as always, if there's a topic you'd like to cover in a future episode of Office Hours, post questions anytime via the Arroya app, drop them in the chat, um, send us an email to support.arroya.metagroup.com, send us a DM. We are on all the socials, as Mandy outlined earlier. And then we record every session. We'll email everyone in attendance a link to the video from today's conversation. It'll also be on the Arroya YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, and share while you're there. And if you find these conversations helpful, please do spread the word. Thank you so much. And we'll see y'all next time. Have a safe flight, Seth. See y'all. Bye, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there.